Hi, uh, my name is Lenore Von Stein, and this is an episode of The Facts. And with me tonight is Bern Nix, Andrew Bolotowski, Rachel Evans, and Beth Griffith. And um, this episode uh, I'm setting in the far future, uh, like a thousand years from now. And I'm doing that because I, 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 I was thinking, what is a safe way to discuss uh, corruption and corporate crime? And, and so either, you know, you, you do this kind of like from the viewpoint of the future or from the past, like Shakespeare. The, the stereotype around drugs is either you're a lazy couch potato stoner eating Doritos, right? Or you're out, you know, finding your fix, all this stuff. But think, the, pres the last three presidents of the United States are all drug users. Obama said not only did he smoke weed, he, uh, he tried coke when he, when he could afford it. President Bush would never answer his youthful indiscretions. <laughs> My youthful indiscretions when I was 40. Uh, you know, so, I mean, you know, Bill Clinton had his uh, famous answer, you know, I, I inhaled, but I, I smoked, but I didn't inhale it. But, you know, the point is, many successful people, from Michael Phelps and the athletes, to leading scientists, Carl Sagan, to presidents, to elected officials, you can't even find an elected official now who says they haven't tried marijuana. And so the point is that, you know, people around our society do take drugs, but the stereotype, the image, and who's getting punished and incarcerated uh, is mostly poor people, poor African Americans, Latinos are the ones filling our, our, our jail cells because of their drug use. Uh, and, you know, that's, that's something we all have to think about. I want all of us to, who, are, who are watching this show, think about what drugs do either do you use, someone in your family use, and would anyone want them or their family members to be locked in a cage because they have a drug problem? How can I judge? judge. There is so, there is so much I, I don't, don't know. And I don't want to take time. The central character in this story is named Palau. Um, and uh, that's a takeoff on the name of a beautiful island, which I'm pretending disappears in 2300 from global warming. And, and, but by year 3000, which is when this story is set, uh, it's, it's being faithfully reconstructed in the same place uh, with the same topography uh, to stabilize the weather, to the currents, animal life, regreen the earth. What positions we'd really like to be able to do is to uh, sort of narrow the uh, possible responses that people have to drugs. You, know, you, you prescribe a, a painkiller. Okay? Some people, the painkiller works. Some people, it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. yeah. Some people, it, you have to give it at higher dosages than, than, than others. You know, but you only know this after the fact, after you, after you have prescribed the drug. I mean, particularly in the case where a drug doesn't work, you know, there, there may be some, some price after you stop taking it. This is a case I had with, uh, I was taking Cymbalta. I was taking Cymbalta for neuropathy, which is tingling or loss of sensation in your extremities, like your fingers or your, mm -hmm. or your feet. So I was taking Cymbalta for that. Cymbalta used to be used, well, still being used to treat depression. Okay. So you sort of taper into using Cymbalta. You, know, you take a, one for a couple of days, and you take it twice a day for, and then you build up to the dosage that's going to be maintained on for a while. And in my case, I had to stop taking it because it wasn't doing anything for my neuropathy. You come off of it, and a very common thing to happen after you've stopped taking it is you get severely depressed. Now, if you were able to know in advance, first of all, whether the drug would work, and then if you were able to know in advance that the that the person would not go into a severe depression afterwards. Wouldn't you like that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But you can only do that on the, paper, on the basis of the individual you are prescribing it to. You know, if you could find a drug that you could be sure on the basis of particularly of genetic information that you could get on the person, mm. that it would have a particular effect. You could match the genetics to the actual tailoring of the drug, then the effect would be a personalized drug.
What is a drug? I mean, how how can you how can you have that glass of wine and 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 not understand what a drug is? Not understand what the effect of a drug is? I mean, you you know what the effect of a drug is. Character Palau is two hundred and ten years old, and uh, she she's but she's fully healthy, fully alive. She she grew up in this boxy apartment, looking over at the sea, and. Um, the earth is very crowded because people, you know, a lot of people, and a lot of them are living to be very old, but all the housing is healthy, the power is renewable and free, people move often, health care, education, transportation is free, and, and many lousy jobs, you know, like jobs with repetitive labor or cleaning, uh, these are done by machines. Drugs relieve stress. Those drugs that relieve stress. How do they relieve stress? Well, there's a couple of different ways. One is actually affecting the, um, the balance of, of neurotransmitters in, in, in the brain. You know, so that's in effect sort of begins. It modulates them. And you can do it a couple of different ways. One is by uh, there are a number of neurotransmitters that go to a cycle, and then you can intervene in the cycle so that they don't get taken back again and recycled, you, 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 then you can modulate the way that the body's responding. You can, you can do it by simply inhibiting the stress response, which, you, which was, stress response is fairly nonspecific. Anything could provoke it. So you can sort of block that stress? In, is yeah, that yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and, you, and you can do that by, you know, by manipulating these neurotransmitters or intervening at particular points in, this, in the stress response. There's an area of the brain called the hypothalamus, which a lot of this is regulated by, by the, uh, through the hypothalamus to um, adrenal, adrenal glands. Adrenal glands is basically what, what sets you off. You know, the adrenaline is a source of energy that activates the stress response, which is basically, it's a, it's a fight or flight response. It's a response to immediate danger. Uh -huh. okay. So if you can block that happening, 
then you block the entire stress response. So that, that's one way you can do it. Another way is you can do it but basically the way alcohol does it, which is by you know, having it work as an uh, area that de depresses activity in the back part of the brain. But alcohol is a back brain to, to depress it. You mean depress it, but literally like sits on it or something? No, if you can imagine, for example, you have, say you have a, a container, got lots of sparks going through it. Okay. You know, if you can do anything that lessens the activity that's in there, lessens the degree of, of, of stimulation, and then you in fact are you know, depressing the activity that's there. The psychological aspect of, a, of it you know, is once you get to a certain level of, of, of that loss of activity and loss of, of stimulation. But you can have it without that. You know, so what, what you actually are doing is you know, lessening the, the stimulation. And in fact, one of the things people often forget is that aside from you know, controlling stuff that goes in to your brain, brain, brain also depends on feedback. So if you can interfere with the feedback loop, you can actually begin to shut down certain kinds of activities going on in your brain. And something like alcohol does that. It's often described in, in drug mythology, you know, that you're feeling so much more, that you're so much more awake. And I thought that was very strange because it seems to me I'm feeling less. You know, I'm happy to feel less. <laughs> I don't want to feel more, but um, I'm not feeling more. So back to this or leading to the central issue at, the, at, at this point in the story. So people are sexually active all their lives, healthy, getting married, you know, da, da, they, they live to be 300, Palau's 210. Uh, many people are bald in this story, you know, because hair is something we don't really need, you know, so it's going to go. And, um, and so the trauma of these multiple breakups, uh, it's, it's a big problem affecting a people's ability to trust each other, to open up and, and, and to enjoy each other. Palau is a musician and she writes music and this is what she's writing about, this inability to, uh, to trust people uh, and, and, and to make, and, and how to... Whatever you've seen, seen and felt, felt you've seen. It's simply, you know, that that it's 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 more available in some places, or is there, you know, one drug that kind of makes you logy and one drug that makes you, you know, speed down the road, or is it that it's uh, something about <laughs> the situation or the that makes one a drug of choice and one not a drug of choice? You do see these kind of cycles of new drugs and new. You know, I remember when I was uh, a number of years ago, it was the ecstasy. Ecstasy was mm -hmm. everywhere, and it was like, you know, it was the cover of all the magazines, and this is the new thing. And then, you know, again, not, none of these drugs ever go away, but, you know, there's just kind of like these cycles. And then in meth now is a huge thing, and meth is everywhere. And, and, uh, and, and so, I mean, there's a, a few things to think about. One is, is the way the media talks about a lot of these things. The media can get very hyped up. And, and, and almost, here, here's, a, here's, an here's a funny example. There's this stuff like K2, you know, alternative, you say uh, marijuana is illegal, right? So chemists and stuff figure out how to make something that has marijuana-like effects, mm -hmm. but uh, it's not illegal. So because marijuana is illegal, we drive people to do even unhealthier kind of chemical stuff because of our, you know, that's the, that's the result of prohibition. So now we're driving people to drive. 
but no one is, you know, no one's doing it. So then the media gets hyped on something. The K2 is everywhere and your kids are gonna be doing this and at the stores. And it's amazing, they, they turn something that, no, salvia, these drugs that no one has ever tried before, and you, you, these, the media thing kind of hypes it up. So for the first time, you know, so is the, was there a lot of ecstasy use in the, in the uh, you know, in the early 2000s? You know, in certain communities, yes. Uh, you know, it, the media that hypes up a lot of this stuff, is there some media kind of fuel that makes it seem like it's everywhere and stuff? Yes. And then this, some of it cycles out naturally, just, you know, think things like almost like fads, things come and go and stuff. But what it doesn't is what it's not related to is like amped up new laws. You know, it's like these laws that kind of come and we're going to like crack down and do that stuff. That actually is not what influences drug use. There's more of these natural cycles. But what happens is once these kind of laws get locked in, they can have consequences uh, for, for many decades. So in this future that I'm imagining, the, the, the things that, many of the things that were impeding people are, have been broken away, and the full person is about to break through, but doesn't quite, hasn't quite made it. And, and, um, and Palau's work, she's, and she's, off, she's, all, she's trying to explore this, this poignant, pregnant state, and um, a personality about to be born under wraps, um, but just thinner wraps than in the past. And aspects of this, of the, of the wariness that people have with each other, of the, of the care in which they take approaching each other, and and, and the amounts of themselves that they show, and and um, and uh, th these have been codified for many centuries now, and, and, and by this time in fine and popular art, and 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 and, and, and these works supply, they supply sympathy and and uh, to the audience comradeship. Um, but they have not really moved the mountain. Uh, you know, they're, they're, the unscientific, uh, you know, explanations that, and, and hysteria that can get whipped up in the media uh, lead, can lead to elected officials making these laws that take decades to undo. And there's uh, another aspect to the whole drug of choice question. And, well, there's a couple of assumptions, you know, simply built into the question. Uh -huh. Yeah. One is that there's a choice. You know, like sometimes when you see sort of a, a sort of a switch that occurs, it's because something that people are usually taking are no longer available, and mm. the people that they get it from have something else to sell now. Mm. I see. You know, that happens. Mm -hmm. You know, you have that kind of situation. And then, of course, there are people who, you know, who, who actually do have a choice, and they prefer some drugs over others. <laughs> You know, it's sort of an aesthetic and experiential thing for them. And depending on what their preference is, they may have to go through a lot to get that. <laughs> they have to go through a lot to get that. Mm -hmm. Particularly if it's something that's not readily available. But I was in, uh, I was in a black community in Baltimore in the, in the early 80s, in Newark in the 70s. And, you know, there were some things that you just couldn't get. You know, if I wanted to get masculine in Newark, I couldn't get masculine. I couldn't get it. Nobody was using it. Nobody was selling it. You know, I could go. Cook, I could get it. heroin very easily. Mm. Just in order to shoot up. Mm -hmm. I could, that easy because a lot of people were selling that. The beginning of the '80s, mm. when crack was coming in, because it came in gradually in in, in Newark and in, in Baltimore. But once it got in there, it was it was a thing. <laughs> it was really explosive. Yeah, and I was there. The kind of drugs, like the sort of party drugs, that wasn't happening in in in, in Newark. You know, so part of it is like what is actually a available to you mm -hmm. and how it gets to you. You know, aside from whatever your f preference is, you know, there was a definite divide between people who were into heroin and people who were into cocaine because cocaine's a stimulant, you know, and, and heroin isn't.
you know, we talk about, you know, you talk about the same drug, right? And we think about meth, right? And mm -hmm. you have an image, and like you said, uh, you know, it's all these people in the Midwest, and they're all strung out, right? At the same time, Ritalin is on every college campus in, in this country. You have students who stay up and they, they take Ritalin to help them with their studying. And so it's, it's another interesting question of like, you know, they're both speed, right? Is mm -hmm. it Ritalin mm -hmm. and, and, and that, you know, straight A honor students are taking or taking Ritalin and someone else is taking math, but we, we can have such a different right. image of, of what that, who that person is. something very straightforward like the crack versus cocaine, the, 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 t the amount of time that's given, the population that's being targeted. Mm -hmm. the The first part of the transition that I see is from viewing, a, well, let's look specifically at addictive drugs as opposed to all the other ones, okay? 
the most serious thing there would be to stop viewing drug addiction as a as, as a state of criminality, mm -hmm. and to view it instead as a, a, a medical problem, you know, which is treatable, but which also has a variety of components to it. You know, you just go back to why some people are using drugs that addict them <laughs> in the first place. You know, so there's a psychological aspect to this, and also a social one because of the way that people's social position, what race they are, who the ancestors were, what they look like, how, how those things impact on them to the point where they would have access to and then actually go out and purchase drugs that addict them. And so the future, ladies and gentlemen, looks very bright to me. And so as we, as we, as we waggle off. <gasps> I really want good, good. So see, I hope you catch us online, whatever, you know. See you around. Good night. Mm -hmm.